Hello class, chapter 14, and the subject of this week's lecture is uh, the process of acquiring and really the implementation of information systems. And this is a really complicated process. It's difficult to pull off, especially the larger the company, the more complex your electronic operations. So it's a really important thing to think about when we're talking about MIS in general. So what does this mean? Well, you're looking at, let's say, creating a new um, customer processing system or an enterprise management system or any system. And you have to think about what do we need and who can help us achieve this? Now, some large companies have their own IT departments. Others do not. Uh, even ones that do will often bring in vendors to help them uh, you know, go through the entire process. Uh, some of the things that you have to think about, uh, the text does an adequate job describing them, just to emphasize. Uh, one, you have to very carefully select your vendors and make sure they have the appropriate expertise, not only for their software, but also for your type of business and your type of application, because that can be an issue. Also, sometimes, and the text highlights uh, some of these issues, you get a little bait and switch. You know, they'll tell you that the system can do something and it really can, or theoretically it can, but it hasn't been tested yet, and, and you're the guinea pig. Um, you have to think about who's going to support this afterwards. If you don't design it in-house, um, are they going to be able to train your people to do it, or are they going to be available to help? Um, you have to think about how much customization is needed because almost nothing just works for you straight out of the box. You have to do some modifications. So who's going to be doing this programming and testing and you know what kind of guarantees do they have that will work? And the last thing you have to think about is this stuff is really, really expensive. When you get programmers involved and other IT professionals, it can be huge expenses, especially if the process doesn't go right. So I'd like to talk about a couple of these processes that I was involved in personally. One was for a uh, multinational corporation, and um, we developed a... Basically, we call it a software overlay. It worked with AutoCAD, and it helped engineers design systems uh, in the construction field. And so it sort of laid over the version of AutoCAD that they had, only gave them the functionality to work with some of our parts. So the design team was spread out across uh, Sweden and Denmark and Italy. And in the U.S., uh, I was sort of in charge of the beta testing. They had developed the software overseas. They were using it a little bit. They wanted um, you know, our, our clients in the U.S. to use it. And so the software was free of charge because the idea was if a customer, or even if our own distributors were using the system, then they would be more likely to buy from us. So some of the earlier issues were just making sure that everything was translated into English. Uh, sometimes you would click on a certain function and you know Swedish would come up or whatever. And so that was a deal for a while. The second uh, issue was figuring out if uh, you know the requirements of the system um, could be handled by everyone using it. And generally the answer was yes because they were using a specific version of AutoCAD. Although the issue was that if they had different versions of AutoCAD, it didn't always match up with our overlay. So that, that did become an issue. And then um, finally, it was the actual functionality of the software. So because we introduced it in the U.S. as sort of a permanent beta test, uh, or I shouldn't say permanent, but a, a beta test that was ongoing, we selected some specific parties to be trained and work with this and, and give us feedback. And some of their early feedback was, you know, it was really lacking the ability to... Um, uh, work with all of our product lines. So we were offering a product line, let's say that was oval duct work, and the system uh, would not work uh, or didn't have those options in it. And then once the options were in, it didn't always uh, give you the full capability of the system. And then later complaints when we started releasing this uh, more nationwide were that it, it didn't allow them to work with the parts of the duct system that we didn't necessarily design. And so they were looking for, you know, being able to put in some, let's say, um, rectangular duct, which we didn't make. Uh, 
So it was an interesting process, and um, so I oversaw those early stages, and then also right into the stages where we were holding training sessions on uh, different parts of the country so that engineers, architects, contractors, and our distributors could come out and be taught. And I did teach some of that and work with uh, some of the Swedes and Danes that they sent out to implement that. So it's pretty interesting. And so that's just a, an example of how the process works. Eventually, quite a few of the customers uh, and you know distributors did use it. And so we would get parts lists of uh, you know further orders from the system, and they thought it was pretty slick. Another example is actually um, on the library side. I was running a public library that used a, a specific integrated library system that was provided by the consortium we belong to. Now, an integrated library system actually controls um, the online public access catalog, which is what you see when you're you know, browsing a collection online, what books do we have, and that kind of thing. It worked our circu circulation system, which is you know, when you go to actually check out a book or another item and, and check it back in. And then also all of our cataloging functions are in there as well. So when we're setting up a item to be shown in the catalog and to keep track of it and that kind of thing, it was in there. So uh, this is a pretty big deal, especially when it's a fairly large uh, consortium of libraries because, you know, you could go in and see what other libraries had. And so there was, you know, a, a tons and tons of items in there. I mean, we're talking probably uh, hundreds of thousands of items in the system. And because public libraries are open a lot, we were open, you know, quite a few hours a week. You couldn't really handle a lot of downtime. If the system was off for any extended period of time, it, it was a big deal. So um, we were switching from a uh, established vendor in the industry to uh, an open source system, meaning it, the, the code and the development of it was open to everyone. The problem is just because it's open source, it doesn't make it free. One, you have to have uh, some programmers help you develop the system for what your uses are. And our consortium, like many other libraries before them, found some partners so you could share the costs to develop some of the features. Um, obviously, the, the local implementations of just getting it set up on your uh, servers and that kind of thing you, you paid for on your own. And then... Um, so they had to select a vendor to help with that process, to help with the training and all that kind of stuff. So they picked a vendor to help with the process in general, and then there was a subcontractor involved with some of the more specific programming. And they had quite a few months to work on this, and it was supposed to there was supposed to be a changeover at a time of year that was less volume than other times, like summer when you have the kids reading stuff going on. So the problem was that when they were supposed to implement it, and they had been showing us, you know, versions of it before they went live so that we could be trained on it, um, we knew that the final version wasn't necessarily going to be the version that we were trained on. So I purposely didn't send all my staff and expend that money uh, for training when I knew it was probably going to be different, and that was also going to be confusing for them, especially for the ones that are not technologically proficient. So I went myself to see it and kind of waited to see what the changes were going to be afterwards. Then they would say, okay, on this particular date, we're going to do uh, the changeover, so we're turning off the other system. You're going to be down for a week. We'll turn on the other one. And so I knew that that was going to take longer than they said, so we prepared for a longer period. And when the system came back on, uh, they said, okay, we want you to start using it. And I told my staff, we're not going to use this for at least another week. And that was a good choice because it ended up crashing or they'd have to take it down to make other changes or whatever. And that went over about a period of about three weeks, actually. And so what we found out afterwards was this uh, sub-vendor that they were using to do a lot of this programming work actually was just one guy uh, working out of Atlanta or someplace. And he was totally overwhelmed, didn't really know what he was, know what he was doing with this particular type of system. And it turned into a giant debacle. So uh, what happened on the customer end of things was that the, the people that were coming into the library to check things in or out weren't able to tell what we had in the collection other than by browsing or us just telling them. 
they weren't able to do quick uh, check-ins and check-outs. We couldn't charge fines and things for a while, so there was a cost associated with that. We had to make giant lists of transactions to process once the system came up. And, um, you know, with other libraries that weren't sort of smart about how they did the training, they had a lot of confused people that were confused for months afterwards because once you train someone to do something a certain way, they're really confused if you change it, especially when it's new to them and they're trying to learn it. So um, that was a great big problem across the system. There was all sorts of errors with people sending items back and forth to different libraries and that kind of thing. And I also I always find issues with their training that, um, a couple of training sessions that I went to were being taught by our consortium's um, trainers. So they were used to training established systems, not necessarily the new ones. So we'd be sitting there and they'd say, well, the system really can't do this. And of course, me being a, uh, a difficult student, I was working ahead and exploring other areas and checking things out and trying to break it and would say, well, actually, it can do this. And they'd say, no, it can't. And I would say, well, yeah, it can, because I just did it three times. And they'd say, oh, well, I guess we didn't know that. So a lot of times these systems aren't properly vetted, even by the people that are supposed to be training others on them. So I just um, shared a couple of those stories to give you an example of some, some real live implementations. Um, they very rarely go smoothly. There's all sorts of issues with them. We've dealt with a couple of uh, system changes at uh, Lincoln as well. And um, some go smoothly, some not so much. But anyway, it's something for you to think about. Whether it's a small business or a large business, a lot of the issues are the same. The magnitude of the issues, obviously, is quite different depending upon the size of your organization or the volume of your activity. So uh, I think you'll find the rest of that chapter pretty interesting. It gets into a lot of depth about the process and the different options that you can have to work through that. And this will actually be the last lecture because it's the last uh, bunch of uh, original materials. So uh, I'll tell you an announcement later, but I hope you enjoyed the class. It was my pleasure to teach it, and we will uh, talk to you later.